Cyprus remains divided 40 years on. In 1974, Turkish forces invaded the island to protect, it said, the Turkish minority. Both sides are still negotiating. So can Cyprus be reunited or will it remain a land divided? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. It's been 40 years since Turkish troops invaded Cyprus, leaving the island divided, with Greek Cypriots on one side and Turkish Cypriots on the other. Nicosia, Cyprus's largest city, remains the only divided capital in Europe. But there is some evidence things may be changing. Many Cypriots appear increasingly hopeful of an end to division, even though they're skeptical of political efforts. We'll discuss the prospects for a peaceful reunification with our guests in a moment. But first, let's hear from our correspondents. Paul Brennan is in the northern Turkish side. For Turkish Cypriots, of course, celebrating here in northern Nicosia, in what the UN describes as Turkish-occupied northern Cyprus, the memories of the 20th of July 1974 are very different from those of the Greek Cypriots. For them, the soldiers came with the purpose of salvation, not invasion. Uh, they came because Turkish Cypriots were being attacked by Greek Cypriot militia. And they came because they wanted to prevent that, to stabilize the situation. 40 years on though, we still have this division of the island. And what not divides the, the two communities, but actually brings them closer together, is the realization that this situation simply can't come on. We've heard it both from people in the street and indeed from the Turkish president, President Gul, in his speech here at this ceremony that we've seen this morning. He says that the current situation, the division of the island, is simply not sustainable. There has to be a solution. It needs to happen soon. But the difficulty is in finding a breakthrough, finding a reason to bring the two sides together, a compromise. And although there are, there are negotiations ongoing and negotiations will continue, it appears the two sides are no closer in reality to finding that crucial breakthrough moment. And Simon McGregor Wood has been following the anniversary events in the southern Greek side of the island. On this side of the divide, of course, the dominant feeling is one of mourning and loss, as you would expect. At 5.30 this morning, as has been the case for decades now, the air raid sirens wailed across the southern half of the city of Nicosia in recognition of the very moment that the Turkish military began its operation 40 years ago. Uh, we went to a uh, ceremony at the main military cemetery at 8 o'clock this morning local time uh, where we witnessed the president Nikos Anastasiades laying his wreath uh, in memory of the almost 6,000 Greek Cypriot soldiers uh, who died during the fighting incidentally 1,600 more than 1,600 Greek Cypriots most of them civilians went missing uh, during the course of the of the violent exchanges there is a sense here, I think, and the people that we've been speaking to on the Greek Cypriot side, that there is an emerging disconnect, if you like, between ordinary people who are increasingly willing to talk and live with their Turkish neighbours and the political elites in whom, frankly, they have very little faith. As you know, there is a fledgling peace talks process. It started in February of this year, but to be honest, of all the Greek Cypriots that I've spoken to during the course of this week, I've yet to find one that has any faith in that process being successful. So as well as the loss and the sense of mourning, there is, I detect, a growing sense of anger and frustration and this disconnect between ordinary Greek Cypriots who want to make a go of it, uh, who try and create a better political compromise for the future, and their politicians, as I say, in whom they have little or no faith. Cyprus became independent in 1960 after its Greek and Turkish communities reached an agreement on a constitution. But three years later, the power-sharing agreement broke down and intercommunal violence erupted. More than ten years later, Turkey invaded the island following a Greek-inspired coup. Greek Cypriots called it an occupation. Turkey said it was just protecting Turkish Cypriots. In the years that followed, several rounds of talks and negotiations achieved little. The UN put forward a plan to unite Cyprus, but that was rejected by Greek Cypriots in 2004. The island eventually gained European Union membership, recognized as the Republic of Cy Cyprus, but it remains a land divided. 
Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our three guests, all from the Cypriot capital of Nicosia. George Lodos is a representative of the Biocommunal Famagusta Initiative, a civil society group comprising Greek and Turkish Cypriots. Ahmed Sozan is chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the Eastern Mediterranean University. Sozan is also a research director at Cyprus 2015, an organization working on a sustainable settlement to the Cyprus problem. And joining us via Skype, Alexander Apostolides, member of the National Economic Council to the President of the Republic of Cyprus. He's also a member of the Economic Action Group that supports the Greek Cypriot negotiations. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with Ahmed Sozan. 40 years of failure to reach a settlement. Do you still think that one is possible? I think that it is possible, but let me make a correction. The intercommunal negotiations between the two communities started the year I was born. That was 46 years ago in 1968 in Lebanon, and then it moved to Nicosia. Although a uh, majority of people on both sides of the UN divide, and it, it is shown in our public opinion poll res, uh, results that we have conducted, uh, people by and large lost most of their hopes on a uh, comprehensive solution. But we also ask a question to both sides of the UN divide. Do you like to, uh, do you have a desire to uh, uh, solve the Cyprus problem? And then majority of Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots on both sides of the UN divide, 70% of each side says that yes, we do desire that the, uh, the negotiations should end with a comprehensive solution. So in a way, there is the desire of the people on the ground, which in a way legitimizes the ongoing negotiations. Well, Alexander so Apostolides, is, is, your, your view on that, uh, ordinary people appear disconnected from politicians, as we mentioned in our earlier report? Uh, well, we, we definitely see that when we're talking about economics. Both communities have serious economic problems. Uh, the Greek Cypriot community had the two very major banks collapsing. The Turkish Cypriot community is now facing new challenges with the depreciation of Belira. And what shocked me is when we went out to the road to to show our study how both communities can benefit economically through a solution, there was no pushback. So this is not 2004. I mean, Ahmed is absolutely right. People are really any they are willing to have a go at it. What worries me is whether the politicians are willing to have a go at it. Of course, we don't know what they're doing in the actual negotiations, but at least in their public pronunciations, uh, they seem to be um, a, a gear behind the, popul the general population of Cyprus, who is eager to do a, a braver step because they're facing many challenges, which perhaps they were not facing so much 10 years ago. Well, George Lauders, your view, do you agree that there is a difference of opinion between the people on the island and the politicians who are supposed to be governing them? Um, uh, the situation here on the island is that uh, larger majorities on both sides uh, would like to see Cyprus reunited uh, in a federal model, but uh, equally large majorities have lost hope. Uh, at the same time, uh, Public opinion on both sides uh, believes that uh, the discovery of natural gas can uh, be beneficial uh, for finding a solution. They also believe that uh, the United Nations uh, should uh, remain on the island. And uh, they also uh, feel that uh, this process is not likely to result in a solution. So this uh, shows the disconnect between the willingness of uh, the people to move forward to a new tomorrow for Cyprus and uh, the, the failure uh, from the political elites to deliver the result uh, so far. Well, Ahmed Sosan, um, 10 years ago a UN reunification plan was put to the people of Cyprus. It was uh, accepted by Turkish Cypriots but rejected by Greek ones. What was wrong with that particular plan, do you believe? Um, I think that uh, the, the crux of the matter in Cyprus is uh, the lack of exposure of uh, people to the idea of a uh, federal model, which is basically power sharing. People uh, were not prepared um, to the idea that uh, the new uh, solution to the Cyprus problem will be a new state where uh, power will be shared, divided and shared by the two communities. I think that 
um, especially the Greek Cypriot community, was not prepared by the political elite to that idea that a federation entails that the two communities will share the power in every level. And that's the, uh, uh, the reality of the life in every federation. I think that um, the political elites failed to convey that message to, um, to the grassroots. That's why there is a big disconnect even today. That's why we are saying that um, if you want to be successful in the ongoing negotiations, uh, we should not leave this to the political elite who have been basically um, conducting the negotiations totally cut off from the general public in the UN uh, buffer zone where the public is not involved. In fact, what is needed in Cyprus is to get the grassroots also to involve in the uh, uh, negotiation process by maybe um, implementing a series of confidence building measures that would bridge the gap of trust between the two communities and that would um, make the people, common people in Cyprus believe that cooperation between the two communities uh, is possible, but at the same time that it is also desirable. If that can be uh, uh, achieved in parallel to the uh, ongoing negotiations, then this can also impact positively the ongoing negotiations. And in cases, this can also put pressure or encouragement to the two leaders uh, to be more courageous uh, in the face-to-face uh, -face leaders level negotiations. Well, uh, Alexander Apostolidis, uh, the argument there that change happens from a grassroots level up, that it's the politicians have been the tail wagging the dog, so to speak. Do you agree with that contention? Well, I would like to see town hall type meetings as well. And actually, we have to say that when uh, especially uh, a former uh, Turkish Cypriot leader tried to talk uh, here in the south. There was an intense pushback by the very vociferous yet very minor, uh, very almost neo-fascist uh, element uh, that exists in our society. But I have to say, I think the, the one of the lessons of 2004 that's very important is that out of that, the, the, the negotiating sides changed. I think the Turkish Cypriot side now uh, as one way or another wants a reward of additional powers perhaps because it's at the yet in 2004 while maybe the Greek Cypriot side is looking to restrict powers uh, perhaps given uh, that were in 2004 in order to believe to be able to push it in a, in a referendum but I think Ahmed is absolutely right that from the moment that both sides are committed that any solution will be given in a referendum and that's actually quite unique I don't think there has ever been um, uh, 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 a, a peace that was uh, accepted by um, uh, decree by by vote. I think then it should be as populous and as transparent as possible. In that we agree a hundred percent. Well, Ahmed Sozan, um, you've had a visit by the um, president of Turkey, Abdullah Gul who has himself now made a call for new talks about reunification. There's also been a call from the Orthodox Church of Cyprus for further negotiations. There appears to be a, a degree of momentum being achieved here. Would you agree? I definitely agree with that. And I you have been saying for some time that the external dynamics in Cyprus or, or on Cyprus, meaning all the actors outside of Cyprus have, uh, have aligned in such a way that uh, they are now pushing for a solution in Cyprus. But what is worrying me uh, in Cyprus is, is the lack of internal dynamics. Exactly what I said, the, uh, the lack of uh, willingness, the lack of, um, um, let's say, faith to take the, uh, the leap of faith by the two leaders, as well as their disconnect with the rest of the, uh, the grassroots. That is uh, what is worrying me. That is the missing element in Cyprus. Otherwise, the external dynamics are definitely there. Well, George Lodo, so your view about that leap of faith that was referred to there, the necessity to somehow inject a degree of trust into this process. You know, um, uh, Cyprus is the one country in the region where uh, Christians and Muslims uh, live uh, peacefully side by side. It's the one country in the region where, uh, uh, which has uh, excellent relations with uh, all Arab countries and Israel at the same time. It is the one country in the region which is a member of the European Union. 
um, we, it is up to us uh, to find the way forward so that our uh, political uh, leaders will uh, put the same amount of effort into inspiring the people to take this leap of faith as they put in for, to their uh, election campaigns, when they're running for office, when they're running for political office. Every minute of every day is uh, spent managing the momentum of their personal campaigns for office. When uh, we would like to see that same energy, that same zest, when they are trying to manage the political climate, which would make possible uh, the resolution of this problem after 40 years. Well, Alexander Apostolidis, um, there have been changes outside Cyprus. Uh, the massive economic downturn has impacted on Greece substantially. Uh, Turkey is still having problems with its membership of the EU, with Cyprus being one of the issues that is paraded in front of that. Are these factors actually building on uh, the players in the background on Turkey and Greece themselves? Um, the, the, one of the problems that the Cyprus problem always had was um, getting to fit the negotiations in the cycles of elections. Uh, in Turkey, in in the north, in the south, in Greek Cypriot, in Turkish Cypriot. I think we're, we're, we're perhaps because of expected results in Turkey are relatively uh, secure. I think we have a golden window now uh, where the actors have enough window to, to actually do uh, serious, I mean, uh, serious uh, movements forwards if they wish to without worrying about elections, as George said rightly. Um, but on, on saying that, it's true that in the end, uh, even if we solve the major issues, um, there are external players in there and they need to be active. And that does include Turkey, that does include the, the EU, uh, because a lot of rules about the EU are key and EU legislation and how it will affect uh, the Turkish Cypriots and need to be resolved. So I, I think I would like to see a lot more a proactive approach in solving problems that we know we're going to have with the, these outside powers. I think they're very good what they're saying, but I don't find them doing uh, as much as they could have been to uh, could have done to to keep uh, the momentum uh, to unlocking things that are locked because of not of Cypriots but because of third parties. Ahmed Sozan, uh, there was a phrase there: a golden window. Do you think that there is a golden window at this particular juncture to push negotiations forward? Look, um, to be very frank with you, I have uh, heard about uh, golden opportunities, windows of opportunities too many times in the last 20 something years that I've been uh, studying and researching on, on the Cyprus problem. So I don't want to uh, say that this is the final golden opportunity, but there is a, an opportunity which uh, was by and large opened by the external dynamics. What I meant by that is, for example, now that uh, in a way Ukraine um, um, was uh, in tension with Russia and the uh, um, Crimea was sort of absorbed by Russia and, and whatnot, this created a new situation where um, the Americans and the Europeans are trying to make the Europeans less dependent on the uh, energy resources to put a name natural gas that they are buying from russia uh, so the uh, the natural gas which is discovered in the whole levant area in the eastern mediterranean uh, that would include the israeli gas and, and 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 the cypriot gas it is making things a bit more urgent it is pushing now that situation itself is pushing now that the problems in the eastern mediterranean is resolved somehow so that this gas can be pumped uh, in a safe and comfortable way to, uh, to Europe to, to diversify their energy needs. So now there is this external dynamic creating a, um, an opportunity for Cyprus. But, but, but as I said a few minutes ago, my worry is inside. I don't see the internal dynamics to be, to be in line and in parallel with the, uh, the external dynamics. That's why um, as a remedy, I'm, I'm proposing that the ongoing negotiations should be complemented by involving the grassroots into the peace process. And one way of doing that is to implement a series of confidence building measures independent of the uh, ongoing peace negotiations so that the uh, common people uh, are involved in cooperating together, working together to create 
some sort of um, this steel and coal community, if I may, to, to use a metaphor, which later created the, uh, uh, the integration of the European Union. So that model should be the model to go in Cyprus. Well, George, Lord, what's your view on that? The idea of creating confidence building measures, the idea of getting the people together to put pressure or to coincide with those external factors that we've been talking about. In Famagusta, we have uh, worked together with our Turkish Cypriot uh, compatriots uh, who are from Famagusta. Uh, and in the last several months, we have together come up with uh, a common vision for the future uh, revival and economic development of the entire Famagusta area for the benefit of all citizens. Um, you know, we've uh, been asked along the way uh, whether this is wishful thinking, whether we are, uh, you know, jumping the gun by trying to plan ahead even before we know when, Fama, you know, Greek Cypriots will be able to return to Famagusta, which is the second divided city on the island. Uh, the Kosia where I'm standing is the capital city is divided, but Famagusta is also divided. Um, and uh, our answer to that is that uh, by daring to dream and imagine the future, we bring the future one step closer. It's the first step. You know, dreams and visions are like maps, and you need maps to, to get anywhere, uh, you know, especially somewhere unfamiliar, like uh, the new state of affairs that we're trying to create on the island, where uh, we will have finally a political resolution here. Well, um, Alexander Apostolides, there has been UN involvement. In fact, it is the longest ever UN peacekeeping mission since 1964 in front. But is there the sense that if this is going to work or if the idea of reunification is going to be sold to everyone on the island, it's going to have to be the Cypriots themselves who push this particular wagon? Uh, I, I think that's right, but also I think it will also banish uh, people who have their own special interest not to solve it. Uh, Ahmed rightly said, like, why isn't there even a game where you can play, where people can practice what by zonal, by communal uh, federation or in political equality means? Uh, and why, by, by not being very clear and not being public, uh, parties on both sides that have their own interest not to solve the the issue can can actually vociferously dominate the, the, the media, even though they're, they're probably a minority rather than a majority. I, I just wanted to say, I mean, the UN role is important and it's been important for a while. Um, we uh, the the fact that there hasn't been a new chief uh, uh, good offices, uh, a new person in the good offices might show that the UN is perhaps uh, downgrading or not very hopeful. Uh, of a solution. You would expect the hard hitter uh, involved with the UN would like to be here and, and be involved if he thought we were close to a solution. And finally, I'm not that optimistic on the gas, um, natural gas. Uh, there's natural gas, of course, that was uh, discovered in the south of the island. Also, there's an enormous water pipe project that will bring water for the first time in substantial quantities in the north. Yes, these things can help peace, but at the same time, it makes new special interests that would perhaps not want to see peace happen. So, you know, every, uh, George is right. We need to think about the future every day and what kind of future we want to have. And that includes all the decisions that the South does for the gas and the North, uh, the Greek Cypriots do for the uh, gas or the Turkish Cypriots do for the water. Uh, they need to be made with the idea of how it's going to be blended in in a future Cyprus. Because if it doesn't, then de facto you're creating it or you're creating this division to go on and on. Well, most people understand that you can't really do that. Something needs to change. Well, uh, Ahmed Sozan, it strikes me during our conversation here finally that if it was left to the three guests on this particular panel, you'd have an agreement by the time the sun goes down. Yes. Um, that's why we are saying that uh, Cyprus problem uh, is uh, very important, that it should not be left only to the politicians, to the only uh, uh, a handful of people on both sides of the UN divide. In fact, if uh, we are going to have a durable and sustainable solution in Cyprus, this sustainable solution should involve uh, the grassroots on both sides of, uh, of the UN divide. We should find ways to engage people into this process, a process where 
by and large, people have been, the grassroots have been um, much more progressive, I'm afraid to say, uh, uh, than the, uh, the, uh, the political elites. Well, at that point, my thanks to our guests, George Lodos, Ahmed Sozan, and Alexander Apostolides. And let us know your thoughts. You can leave your comments on facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story or go to at AJ Inside Story on Twitter. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now.